who is the personification of cool? Ooh. <laughs> like, you know, here's the new cute thing. Take a look at him and go, ooh, ah. I'm just talking about, like, you know, being romantic, I guess, which is, I guess I have a little of. Me, I run my life. In the world of entertainment, Leonardo DiCaprio isn't old, but he's definitely a veteran. He's been acting since he was a kid, but these days, he's a big star. How did he become a marquee name? You'll find out in the next half hour. It's all right here with Leonardo DiCaprio Uncut. Life secrets. Leonardo DiCaprio Uncut. I'm Todd Newton here at CFI in Hollywood, the processing facility that handled over a million feet of film for James Cameron's epic movie, Titanic. Now, just to give you an idea of how much that is, this reel holds 1,000 feet. So let's see if my multiplication is correct. It'd be about 1,000 of these, and that's a lot of film. But I'm not here to test my reel. And I know what you're saying, Todd, that sounds kind of funny, you know, doing a retrospective on somebody who's... I don't think I was very big. I wasn't as big as Kirk Cameron, I'll tell you that much. But, uh, you know, I had some teen following. Who do I look like? <laughs> little Ricky Schroeder, I think. Oh, yeah, uh, Ricky think Schroeder. this one. Yeah. Then we can... Young, yeah. Young River Phoenix. Stardom started early for Leonardo. By the time he was hired at 16 to star with TV's biggest teen star, Kirk Cameron, on the hit show Growing Pains in 1991, he'd already been acting for more than 10 years. He starred in commercials and the kids' show Romper Room before landing on the sitcom. And he was an on-the-set cut-up from the start. I know what? we can show him what? our little drawings. Show us little drawings. Oh, the you little see drawings. We draw drawings of each other. Brian is the famous artist, and we always make fun of each other and portray each other in silly, satirical ways. Leo's job on this set, for some reason, is to make fun of me all day long. OK, so here we have Robert De Niro, right there. See Robert? From the beginning, Leonardo Wilhelm DiCaprio was destined to be a spirited boy. He received his first name after swiftly kicking his mother from her womb as she admired a Leonardo da Vinci painting. Born in Los Angeles on November 11, 1974, Leonardo was the only child of George and Ermeline DiCaprio, who divorced when he was just a year old. Leo was like, says he was raised in Compton. He likes to make us think that he's straight out of Compton. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, pale as a dead fish belly and blonde hair is straight out of Compton. He didn't grow up in Compton, but he did grow up in Hollywood. And he admits he wasn't much of a student, preferring to entertain his classmates rather than do his homework. I, uh, I was sort of a class clown, and my publicist is looking at me. Put that. Sarcastic jerk. It sounds well. That's what you want. Yeah. I was say. Right now Sarcastic is... jerk. Is it right? Write it now. There it goes. See, you like it? Leo, as you know, is the latest, hottest, hunkiest teen idol there is. Yeah, his <laughs> muscles. Look, speaking of hunky, huh? Okay. Leo, what's it like to be a teen idol? Oh, uh, ask her Cameron. Uh, I don't <laughs> Well, I see my pictures there, and fun seeing those, and uh, I haven't really got the full impact of it yet, so. I don't know about that teen thing. I mean, I think it's good. I think it's good for publicity, but... They don't, it's almost like they're not actors, you know what I mean? It's like they portray them as like sort of a piece of meat. <laughs> like, you know, here's the new cute thing, take a look at him and go, ooh, ah. So I, I didn't dig that, no. I wanted, to, I wanted to do characters which I could really get into and really, really act and make things reality and not something contrived, you know what I mean? By 1993, when he did interviews for What's Eating Gilbert Grape, Leonardo felt he was no longer a teen idol. I, didn't, I don't really have that anymore. It's sort of gone, it's sort of diminished. Thank God. No. Well, Leo, you know what, buddy? I hate to be the one to break it to you here, but I don't think you've outgrown like a dog. And uh, he read for the part in that first reading. I noticed from his gaze that he had entered the mind of this retarded boy. That's Swedish director Lasse Hallström who hired Leo to play the retarded brother of Johnny Depp's character in What's Eating Gilbert Grape. Well, I knew that this character was one of those characters that doesn't come along very often, especially for somebody my age. To do a character like this, a lot of that is, is offered to people, uh, you know, who are older, men who are older, like Dustin Hoffman's character, and, you know. Um, so I knew this was one of, those, one of those characters that just I had to do. And I had to do it, and I had to prove to Lassa I was going to do it. So after he cast me, I just went, I went to a home, 
and I met about 10 kids with disabilities, and I wanted to make this crystal clear how I wanted to do this. I picked up stuff from them. It was, it was a lot of little twitches and a lot of, they did a lot of swaying from back and forth. Um, but Arnie was just sort of something I made up in a way. I like took little things, you know, I borrowed stuff, but then I, I made it my own. He could enter this guy, he could do this guy, he could switch him on, sort of. Uh, he's not the typical method actor who needs to, to get into the emotion before the take for, for ages. <laughs> he, he's goofing around with his part and having a lot of fun. He kids around on the set and he, he's just a great guy to work with. In Marvin's room, Leo starred with Diane Keaton and Meryl Streep as Streep's pyromaniac son. Meryl Streep and Diane Keaton were just my two favorite actresses of all time, even before I, I did this film. And, um, you know, Meryl is just such a presence when you work with her. I mean, she throws you so many curveballs all the time. You've got you've to be on your toes with her because, you know, she may do something completely different the next take, and you've got to sort of be prepared. So, you know, anytime you work with people of that caliber, mm -hmm. you learn a lot. He made his own presence known and shocked some fans with his portrayal of high school heroin addict Jim Carroll in The Basketball Diaries. But once again, he did his homework, this time studying drug addicts. The best part was really getting into the drug stuff because, I mean, I could separate the fact that, you know, what reality was from, you know, from the film. And I, and I just got to really, it was like an actor's thing to do, you know. And uh, I hope it came across as real. Now, how does... Leonardo DiCaprio is being hailed as one of the finest young stars in Hollywood. It's funny because um, Romeo and Juliet, I think, is really the the film that uh, you know put my face out there more than anything, and uh, it's it's interesting having to sort of deal with uh, how my life has changed now, and you know, it's truly really not that bad. It's not the worst thing in the world to be recognized. I. I uh, I heard a whole bunch of horror stories about it, but it's not, it's not really that bad. I mean, you just, I think the main key is to sort of just try and be comfortable with yourself in outside environments and people, you know, not always, but they will feel more comfortable around you. In 1996, Leo starred in a 90s version of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet from Australian director Baz Luhrmann. There was no other Romeo, I, I, I was thinking about doing this project. L it took an enormous amount of time to convince the studio to do it. I discovered they had these scenes where, like, Romeo hung out with the rest of the guys and talked about women. You know, I started to realize that he was a normal guy, and that's what really started to make me appeal to the character. But by the time it came to cast the right Juliet, Claire Danes was the one who caught Leonardo's eye and held his attention. She had a lot of power to what she was saying, and she was the only one during the audition that looked me right in the eye and really, you know, gave it to me and didn't, uh, didn't let loose. He's so brilliant. He's really, really, truly um, amazing as an actor and, and, and as a person, too. So it was great to learn about him on and off camera. With Romeo and Juliet, Leonardo was suddenly a hot commodity. One magazine pegged him as one of Hollywood's elite. When you read something about you, people sort of want to define you in one sort of way and say that's what you are when you yourself don't even know what you are, you know what I mean? Get to a point where you're saying you're reading this and saying is this what I am, you know, I, have, I don't even know that. Why, why are you impressing this on me? I don't know that. So, I mean, I, I've been away so much and my, my home life has been so the same. I mean, since junior high school, it's sort of remained the same. You know, I just have a lot more responsibilities as far as like, this is like my job now, you know what I mean? And, you know, I get recognized a lot more than I ever have in my life, but, you know, how bad is that? I mean, somebody coming up to you and telling you they like your work is not the worst thing in the world. It's not like you get, you know, a knife stuck to your throat every day or something. It's, it's, it's not that tedious, and it's not really as bad as, it, as it's cracked up to be, I don't think. Leo had already spent four months in Mexico shooting Romeo and Juliet when James Cameron cast him for Titanic and sent him back to Mexico for many more months of shooting. Cameron compares DiCaprio to a young Gary Cooper. Leonardo is a great actor, possibly the greatest actor of, of his age out there. Before he took the role, Leo was apprehensive about taking a part in what was bound to be a mega hit. Well, yeah, it's sort of my big commercial try, but I looked at it this way. I mean, I, I've been sort of so opposite with that. You know, I've sort of 
been trying to never do something like that. And I mean, I, I certainly am not going to continue being, you know, the commercial guy. I don't want to. I don't want to go that route. But I don't want to discriminate a piece of work just because it is commercially, you know, has commercial potential. I mean, I can't be that extreme. By all counts, Titanic was a long, intense shoot. You've, you've got to know going into the Titanic that you're gonna you're gonna go through some stuff. But Leonardo chilled out on the set by playing video games and practical jokes on director James Cameron. After spending plenty of time in cold water on sinking ship sets, Leo dumped a bucket of ice water on Cameron's head and got away with it. You know, Leo was a hoot. It was like having, you know, a younger brother I never had. Leo's infectious. If he, you know, if he's, if he's in a good mood, you know, which during eight months of filming, you're going to have a couple of bad days. But... If he's in a good mood, man, it's just, it just, you just, everybody feels it. I mean, he's just a lot of fun. And he's a good mimic. According to more than one source, he likes doing impressions of everyone from Robert De Niro to Sharon Stone. Sharon, 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 Sharon. Sharon. Leonardo said at Titanic's Tokyo premiere that the film made a man out of me. A quote he says he's since come to regret. With the LA premiere of the movie, the baby cheeked rebel who barely shaves finally had to face up to the role of leading man, thanks to some help from E's Melissa Rivers and myself. Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio. I love, you know what, can we do something real quick before we get into the interview? Let's do something for all these people back here. Look at that, man. That's what it's all about tonight, right? That's what right? it's all about. That's what it's all about. So, an amazing evening for you so far? I mean, it's pretty spectacular. I've never done a film sort of near this caliber in my lifetime, and I don't think most people have, so it's unbelievably shocking to see all this. I mean, I'm a little overwhelmed, but it's cool, you know? Just trying to keep it real, I guess. Cameron says he actually didn't think of Leo first when he was writing and casting the movie. It's rumored that both Chris O'Donnell and Matthew McConaughey were being considered for his Titanic role. But when the director got Kate and Leo together, he saw magic. I met them both in the normal course of, of casting and, and was just vastly impressed both by, by Kate and by Leo. Kate, you know, uh, just for her, for her command, you know, as, as, as an actor and for her, the, the luminosity of her face, her eyes, her expressiveness, there's something that just makes you want to spend time with her. And with Leonardo, of course, you know, I mean, what need I say more? Uh, he wasn't a star, really, per se, when I met him. He was a very promising you know, young talent and uh, you know we got a little bit lucky with his with his you know recent stardom which hopefully Titanic will even increase but uh, with Leonardo I, I saw I saw a guy who had the he had the had the looks who had the acting skill who had the, uh, the kind of inherent charm necessary to play this guy who can talk his way into any situation and charm this girl out of her entire world you know which is really what was necessary Despite his success, Leo says he doesn't feel like a big star. I tend not to think about that. <laughs> That's a, a pressure-filled, you know, statement. <laughs> wow, that shit. Leonardo, what's your favorite thing about fashion? fashion? <laughs> the clothes. My favorite the girls. thing about, yeah, the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Although he doesn't say much about his personal side, friends say his longest relationship was with model Kristen Zhang. And Leonardo admits his big screen Romeo experience didn't necessarily translate to real life. I certainly don't think I would go to quite the extremes that Romeo did at all, but I definitely have to say that, you know, like everyone else, when you have a girlfriend, you get that side and it comes out in you and you can't help it, you know? it's that, you know, but my, I'm, I'm talking about like a, you know, an uchi kuchi sort of way. I'm not talking about like this passionate love thing that he went through because I, don't, I can't even identify with that stuff. I mean, that's really intense. I'm just talking about like, you know, being romantic, I guess, which is, I guess I have a little of. You're blushing. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I hate to talk about that. <laughs> These days, he's being chased himself. He was followed by fans while shooting The Man in the Iron Mask with Jeremy Irons, John Malkovich, and Gerard Depardieu. He plays a young king in the film, based on another novel from Alexander Dumas, who wrote The Three Musketeers. Feels great. Um, this is possibly the most fun character I've ever played in my life, so. I've had a couple of fun characters to play, but this is like the most flamboyant, and I get to uh, be very cocky, which is fun. 
When he's shooting a film, even outside the United States, he enjoys having his best friends along to visit. But when he's not working, Leo is known to like late night hangouts like the trendy Sky Bar in LA's exclusive Mondrian Hotel. And although it may make big name directors and studios nervous, Leonardo refuses to give up his interest in such extreme sports as skydiving or bungee jumping. While bungee jumping may not require a designer wardrobe, Leonardo has been known to dress the part of a young star when he's in the public eye. Yet he claims it's not a topic he spends much time thinking over. Actually, it's not something that's on the forefront of my mind, but I do have to say that, you know, you try and look, try and look your best all the time, I'd say. Leo says his first priority with all the money he's made isn't to buy fancy clothes. He says he'd like to buy new houses for both his mom and dad. But the one thing money can't buy are awards, like the Golden Globes and Oscars. He's been nominated for both and says he wouldn't mind finding a spot for one of those coveted trophies. Man, I'd love it. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> you know I'd love it. Uh, but it's not, it's not like I'm going to expect it, you know. You got to let these things come if they come, and if they don't, then you just, you know, you don't think about it. Just deal with it if it comes in front of you, then, then that's when I'll start thinking about it. But right now, it's a little thought in my mind, but nothing, nothing major. These days, he's on a roll. Still, he gets butterflies each time he starts a new project. I think every movie I do, I get nervous, you know. And especially in a situation like this, I would be inhuman not to be nervous working with these people. But uh, you gotta just focus on your character and, and um, focus on what, what the story's about. But after doing back-to-back -back projects, he now says it's time for a bit of unfocusing. I, I'm gonna try and take a long break because I've been working very hard. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Uncut.